Thank you all very much for listening. We've now come to the questions and answers section. And I have to say, I'm absolutely bowled over by the amount of questions that have been asked both in the chat box and the Q&A box. I've tried to join them together for the speakers just so I can ask you particular questions. And then there's some general questions as well, people. So Mary Glocknia, there's been a good few questions for you right from the beginning. And a couple of people have pointed out about the moist wound healing principles, but said you very much mentioned about daily assessment and how you check that wound, which left a little bit of confusion because they've said, if you're leaving the dressing on for a few days, what should they be writing in their documentation to ensure that they don't become sued really, Mary? Yes, um, excellent questions today, all of them. Um, for that particular question, um, in my practice, I like to use a, uh, a non-adhesive dressing, uh, something like Telfa, something that uh, you can easily remove daily to assess the skin tear. And then as I showed in my presentation, I use the tubular net bandage um, as a secondary dressing to hold on the dressing. So it's easy um, to remove and assess the skin tear every day. So just something that's non-adhesive. Mary, I think as well, one of the issues is, particularly in the UK, the skin tears may be being cared for in the community, for example. So the district nurse goes see that patient, but may only go on a Monday and a Thursday. So they'll put a dress on that they think they can leave on for you know a good few days. What would you recommend there for documentation? Um. Well, if, if, you know, the nurse is just seeing the uh, skin tear twice a week, you would just document twice a week. So, you know, as often as, uh, as you're seeing the wound, um, you would document that often. That's what's important for legality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really useful because people talk about documentation and it's about really being very clear, I think, about your rationale, isn't it, as well, so that the person that picks up your documents next thinks, oh, the skin tear looked okay, I only need to change it every three days unless the person tells me they've got pain or this excess exudate. So it's documenting what you see very clearly. Yes, correct. So somebody has also said they're really impressed about the guidelines you were talking about but they said, do you think you could add into some of these guidelines the importance of communication as well with the family and the patient and document what you've communicated? Because they feel that may be something that people don't always do. Uh, I think sometimes as nurses, we forget about that aspect. Um, so, yes, I think that was a very good suggestions, a suggestion um, that this uh, panelist uh, asked about, you know, should we include that? We have that in some of the articles that we've written, you know, that are on the ISTAP website. But I would agree that, you know, talking to the family um, and the caregivers, that would, uh, it could be definitely incorporated in part of our um, toolkit or our guideline. Um, even, um, uh, yes, I think that's a very good suggestion to include the family and communication. And I think also V has just written in the chat box as well to document the education provided as well to the patients and family and to ensure that they say back to you that, yes, I've understood it or no, I've not understood it. So you can document exactly the level of understanding of that person as well. Absolutely. That is very important to uh, make sure that that's documented in the written record, yes. Because yeah, we often say in the notes, um, patients and relatives told what to do, but nobody actually says, did they understand it? Did they question it? And what sort of information have you left behind for the person to look at later? Um, right. There's also a question that says, do you have any suggestions for risk reduction strategies against skin tear malpractice? Yes, um, as I as I uh, showed in my presentation this morning, um, I think that all the articles that are on the ISTAP website are are key. Um, 
there's, you know, those, those, uh, the 21 article that was published and the, uh, 2022, all those articles that are on the ISTAP website, those are excellent tools, um, to use to prevent any kind of malpractice. And I think it's really highlighted, isn't it, that the documentation, people don't go into somebody's home to cause an issue. They go into the home or the hospital ward to help that person recover. But we sometimes fall down on the documentation and don't always document very clearly what's happened, your rationale, your education and the communication strategies as well. Yes, and that first lawsuit that I presented this morning, that was really the problem, was that, um, you know, the nurses said in their depositions, oh, yes, we talked with the family members, and yet it wasn't documented in the record. So it must be documented, um, you know, in the actual record. Because sometimes these lawsuits don't occur until two years at two or three years after you've taken care of the patient. So the only the only thing that the attorneys have to look at is the written documentation. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Sam, you've got your hand up. No, sorry, I wanted to ask uh, Mary a question actually, but it's not on your list of questions, Karen, so forgive ah. me for jumping in. But Mary, I'm interested in your comment about obviously the ISTAP recommendations and best practice documents being available on the website and people should refer to them. So in your experience in any malpractice suits, are those ISTAP documents and best practice recommendations considered standards of care that people would be expected to follow? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Mary, sorry, there's lots of questions for you as well. One of them was, and this is obviously somebody from the States as well, who said, um, are there any insurance policies that cover treatment and costs of skin tears? Yes. There are particular ones that they can, sorry, they're asking, are there any insurance policies that would cover treatment and costs for skin tears? Yes. Uh, to answer that, I would no, there are in the United States, there are no insurance policies that cover any particular uh, kind of a, a wound, you know, wh whether it be a pressure injury, a skin tear. No, there's no particular insurance policies that patients can can buy. Whatever uh, whatever insurance someone has uh, covers, you know, in general, all their medical care. So there's not anything in specific specifically that covers uh, skin tears. Good question. Thank you, Mary. And um, I'll relieve you of questions now. <laughs> so <clears throat> Laura, thank you for your session. Fascinating as well. And there's obviously been questions. One of the questions was, you talked a lot about purple, blue, gray skin discoloration, but are there any examples of these that you're able to share with people or people can go and look for to um, enhance their education knowledge? So that's one of the deficits that I think is having um, not just a repository of images, but having them be accessible. So a lot of them are behind a paywall at this time, like visual diagnosis is a really good uh, medical site, um, up to date is another site, but those are all fairly expensive to access, but they have, you know, reputable um, images. You, if you Google search this, you, um, you know, you come up with all kinds of things that are not what you're looking for. <laughs> so that can be uh, very misleading for patients and providers alike. So I know um, at the AAWC, we're working on collecting images. Um, I know MPIP, EPUAP are working on collecting images to be able to share, to make those accessible, at least to members, but ultimately I think for the public. Um, I'm working on also with the American Heart Association, looking for the presentations in ischemia and things like that amongst skin tone. So again, making sure that those are um, things that people can access. So I don't have anything um, free at this time, but that is something that I know multiple organizations are looking for to be able to show that. Yeah, and we too are, Laura, as well. It's mm -hmm. always really yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. You also 
it was interesting because you talked about culture as well and mm-hmm. not just looking at skin tone color but looking at the whole patient like we always teach as well mm-hmm. but how do you think because there's some cultures that will people have been saying that look after their own family and will never mm-hmm. access health care and say no that's fine we can manage it mm-hmm. how do you think we can reach those hard to reach communities to ensure that not to ask them to come to hospital, but to ensure that they're able to protect the skin or actually manage a skin tear should that occur. Yeah, so making sure that the um, education is, is again, accessible to people, that it's in the language that they're looking for. If you have certain populations that live near you, making sure that you have it you know, translated into that language and um, look at how people are accessing information too. And they're looking for shorter things. They're looking for things in videos. Um, so to have them in that that style of content and in the language, I think is very helpful to be able to reach as many people as possible. And then, you know, I like having um, pre-prepared like slide decks or, um, you know, short educational pamphlets and things for nursing schools and, um, the like to hand out because they're going to senior centers, they're going to community centers, they're going to churches and things when they're doing other vaccination clinics, etc. So that would be a good opportunity to be able to, you know, hand out that information and extend your reach in whatever community, you know, uh, the culture that you have where you live. Also, Laura, because obviously we're talking about skin tears within today as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Do you think that within some cultures that skin tears aren't perceived to be a wound? That this is just a skin tear, so why should I worry about it? Yeah, and in the medicine culture, I would say that they feel that way, right? Yeah, but I mean, absolutely. So, um, and that gets down to just having, I think, good basic wound first aid and let you know, letting people know to to protect general openings in the skin and that type of a thing to make sure that they're doing good basic uh, wound care to prevent it from becoming complex and chronic. Do you think it translates as well, Laura, the term skin tear? Do you think it translates mm-hmm. across cultures or does it get lost? I think it absolutely gets lost. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on translating some things into Arabic recently in terms of wounds. I'm a nurse practitioner. um, So I know those terms are represented in, you know, amongst languages and things. And I think skin tear, you're right, is absolutely one of those terms that may not uh, be translated well. Yeah, and it's difficult to try and think of a different term, I think, because for us, skin tear it Mm -hmm. describes it it's a tear on the skin but like you say maybe we need to think about is there another way to describe this wound just and then that Mm -hmm. would heighten awareness across different cultures as well Mm -hmm. and that would go into you know probably sampling specific groups of people working with interpreters translators that you know are aware of having a foot in both uh culture both languages and seeing you know and then and then identifying those terms and going back to focus groups and things and saying when i say this term what does that mean to you you know and evaluating what you've come up with Mm mm-hmm laurie do you know you've just offered now don't you to work with our (laughs) staff to do this work (laughs) You, you have grants? Um, we do it because we love it. <laughs> but uh, Sam, you've yeah. got your hand up. Yeah, just coming back to terminology, um, it's interesting. I just wanted to make the point that in some cultures that have translated some of ISTAP's work, they've actually kept the term skin tear and not tried to translate it because that's maybe one way forward uh, of because if it doesn't translate... Um, and also, I've just noticed on the chat, um, there's somebody, Ayat al Zaid is an Arabic speaker offering to help, I think. I've just offered his help, his or her help, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so I think that it, it's worth thinking about, does the word or the term skin tear need translation, or is it that we just adopt that term with a good definition and good educational materials to support adoption of it? Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Laura. Um, Elizabeth, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just we, we talked briefly about systems, and if you if you when you look at terms, I just want to bring up that uh, the issue of systems. If you're thinking of changing the language, uh, I come from the U.S., 
And um, there's very specific language that if you did move away from skin tears, there, there are uh, at least our payers and our government um, regulators uh, would call certain things for non-payment and where it would be recorded on uh, forms, particularly in long-term care where many older people are residing, at least in the US, and skin tears are part of the assessment, but lacerations, for example, is not. So we need to think about the implications because words do count. And if there are implications beyond like regulators and payers, not just you know people understanding. So I just want to point that out. I think Elizabeth, it's more about not changing the term skin tears, but having um, adjunct terms that people may recognize when you can't translate it into Correct. another language yeah Correct and the implications for regulators at least yes. in certain countries okay yeah and in fact while I've got you and Gary here I'm going to go on to your questions that are specific for you thank you Laura um so Elizabeth and Gary people are thank you for your presentation excellent really good and nice to see you working in tandem as well which is always good to see um <laughs> You, but you've said that the elderly have a less acidic skin, which worries me because I'm getting very elderly now. So I'm thinking about my skin a lot. But are there any acid ointment to improve the pH for the skin barrier? Gary, I think that's probably I like you. that question. Yeah, that's that's kind of my territory. Yeah. But um, older definition is the difference between your age and 100. So if you're 75, it's 87. So, you know, it keeps climbing. Uh, but in terms of uh, the acid creams, any cream containing glycerin or lactic acid uh, will help decrease the pH. And of course, the lower the pH, the less likely pathogenic bacteria uh, will come on the skin and the acid mantle kind of protects us from a lot of bacteria. So that's one way that we can do it. So uh, look for things. There's quite a few that will have glycerin or lactic acid, or ask your pharmacist for some advice on that. And then Elizabeth, going on from what Gary's just said, so that's just like your science base. When you're trying to get this message out to the general public, particularly because we're trying to get people to prevent skin tears, how do we get across to people which creams to use at the age, at different ages? Well, I, I really believe very strongly in getting the message into lay uh, magazines and literature that people read. And for instance, in the United States, there are organizations geared to the elderly that people uh, read. And uh, to me, it'd be wonderful if, uh, and I'm sure other countries have this also, the US is not unique in this, but getting the information, an article, a quick little article written that maybe could be in there. Uh, I also think that having discussions with the large pharmacy chains, every country has you know different places that products are sold. So and that, you know, many times the people will go to the pharmacist as a uh, recommender of, you know, what should I put on my skin? And there's many, many products over the counter. So I think, you know, linking with them on a corporate level would be really, you know, helpful so that people, when they're searching, could uh, could ask somebody reliable and not just say, well, you use this brand, you know, whatever. And I think getting multiple messages from ISTEP onto the internet, because many people are searching for information on YouTube and other places, so I think it's a multiple bombardment of information to, to people. Some people use the internet, some people don't. Some people use printed journals, some people don't. So uh, I also think that there's lots of um, news programs that have like uh, health and information segments. And if you can get a popular reporter or somebody to maybe interview one of you on, on ISTEP day or something, to get the message out, that would be another vehicle that I would recommend I step to look at. And there's another, well, a comment really that we all know skin's really important. We know it's the largest organ. 
and we know that everybody has skin, therefore we should all be interested in it. But it's often seen as, <laughs> it's what I keep telling my students, and they look yeah. at me blankly, but still it's seen as, oh, it's only skin, and why should I be interested, and why should I develop my knowledge in this? And yet that's the only organ everybody's going to have to look after at some point in their careers. How do you think we excite people about learning about the skin and its structure and how to manage it? Uh, I'll start and I'll let Gary finish. How's that? And I, I think that uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, when I, I taught in several schools of nursing, so carving out some time in the curriculum to really talk about skin is uh, a challenge. And I think one of the ways that that I did was to get content on the state boards, because at least in the United States, if questions are asked on state boards, then it gets taught in the curriculum. And if you can get to your state boards and talk about the importance of skin, how it really is a, is a window into so many other health and illness conditions that patients have, you know, when, when you think about it, you know, renal disease with uh, uric acid on the skin, for example, uh, liver disease with, with jaundice on the skin, uh, th that it can be an early indicator of pathology that's going on to people, uh, that that would be a reason to really pay a little bit. And you all can come up with lots of other examples. Those are just two that popped into my head, that uh, the skin really is important. It, it really tells you a lot about what's going on in the person. And it's a and you, you may all disagree with me, but I think it's a quicker way sometimes to see some of the signs and then some of the more invasive and expensive types of ways to diagnose what's going on uh, with patients. And then, of course, we all love it. So, you know, I think our, our passion uh, is really something that we can infuse into, you know, students. So, yeah. Gary, as the dermatologist, what, what else would you like to add here? I think uh, skin needs a 10% stratum corneum moisture to be intact as we get older and the skin's thinner. It's more susceptible to dryness. Don't overbathe. You only need soap under your arms and the groin around the anus. You don't need to scrub the rest of your skin. Apply the moisturizers within two to three minutes. Um, low allergens, so you don't want lanolin and you don't want perfumes. Um, eumectants bind water to the stratum corneum, urea, lactic acid, ceramides, glycerin, and uh, emollient moisturizers keep, uh, if you like, a um, an oil film above the skin. And so those are things like Vaseline intensive care or, you know, uh, Pond's cream, etc. And on that, I'll stop. Thank you both. So I'm just thinking that Skin is the gateway to understanding the health of the patient mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trying to let people know more about that. It's the it external just... reflection of the internal milieu. Mm -hmm. I like it. I want to copy all <laughs> these down. I'm going yeah. to borrow it, Gary. <laughs> you may. <laughs> <laughs> you'll hear me say it soon and you'll think she's copied off me. <laughs> I'm okay with that. That's, yeah, a, that's a, right. a form of flattery. No problem. No problem. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Jill, there's a few questions, particularly for you as well. And somebody said, how do you differentiate a skin tear from Marzi? Because people are thinking they're getting a lot of incorrect, um, um, you know, people saying the wrong thing. I just went completely blank then. Uh, yeah, look, that, that's really tricky. Um... I think that uh, it, it is confusing, and I, I agree with that in clinical practice. Um, it, it's hard because the MARSI is a trauma and the skin tear is a trauma, and it does just remove the, you know, it can damage the the very outer layer of the skin. So I, I'm not sure how you can actually do that precisely. 
Um, but I think it's about looking at the etiology of the injury and the um, me mechanism of action and the shear force. So I think the shear force from the adhesive or the tearing force is very similar to the skin tear. Um, yeah. mechanism it's a bit like injury. Melanie. Yeah, yeah, was talking about, isn't it, that you didn't have a skin tear, but that shear force from the plate. Yeah. Chicken and yeah. egg sometimes as well. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, there's, there's clearly more work to be done there. And, I, I, you know, I was thinking a lot about that when uh, in the mammography section that Melanie um, presented as well. That mm. There's lots of kind of overlap that we haven't really thought a lot about that need more research, yeah. Actually, right, so there's another question as well, Jill, which is, we have global standards such as the International Classification of Diseases, ICD. Do you think that using that can sometimes perpetuate a silo approach because we're required to classify and code and then oh, it stops the joined up thinking? Yeah, that is such a good question. And I, I have thought about that a fair bit. And I, look, my I've got feet in both camps there because we really do need to have clear definitions and classifications. But I think um, contextualizing those classifications within the within the bigger picture is always is always critical. You can't separate different injuries from from the person and what they and their multimorbidities and all the factors that can contribute to a skin injury. So yeah, it, it it really is tricky. And we had this conversation about language as well. And I think that's an important consideration um, to consider the language. It has to be consistent and standardized. Um, but but you know my my bottom line is always looking at the holistic approach but I think um, also in terms of holistic approach and, and as I said we we have become we were a little bit siloed because we maybe had blinkers on we were just looking for instance if we are just looking at say pressure injury prevention then that can you know, lead us down a pathway of just thinking about terminology about pressure injury and and so forth. So while we still have those very important terminologies, I'm hoping that perhaps as we move forward and there's evolution in our language and how we approach skin safety, that we can perhaps come up with some more um, inclusive and holistic terminology that can represent skin vulnerability and frailty and what the implications are for that. But that's a ways off yet. And I think Elizabeth made a good point as well about payers and being able to be paid. Exactly. The laceration that just suddenly it, it, ruins everything. So we've got to be exactly. so careful. Yeah, and I think adding to that, you know, that the whole issue certainly about um, penalties and litigation around, you know, there was a lot of penalties around um, pressure injury prevention. So it made people very, very focused on, okay, we, we this is really important and it's a um, key performance indicator for healthcare providers. And then maybe to the detriment of looking at other skin safety issues. Yeah, it's a minefield. Once you start yeah. chatting about it and everybody starts saying their bits, you think, oh, if I do this, it'll affect that. If I do that. Very much a cascade issue. Yep, I agree. Brilliant. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Um, there's been now, surprisingly, Chloe and Annette, there's been lots of questions about your skin tear packs. Um, so somebody's asked, really love the session, thought it's a brilliant idea but they weren't sure whether or not you had a contact layer dressing included within the pack because they only heard the cal calcium alginate, the silicone bordered, and they would prefer to use a contact layer as a primary dressing after bleeding is managed with a type 1 skin tear. Thanks for having us. Um, yes, definitely there's a contact layer part of the pack so the calcium alginate can be your contact layer if there's bleeding and then if there's not bleeding as per the pack you don't need to use 
the calcium alginate. The silicon foam itself has a silicon layer over the top. So that's an all-in-one contact layer. You don't need to add another dressing to it if you catch the skin tear when it's occurred um, because we're not dealing with an infected wound. We're not dealing with any of those weird and wonderfuls just yet, hopefully. Hopefully with the right skin um, tear management, you prevent that. You prevent, as we've just been speaking about, the chronicity that can happen from not managing a skin tear right when it actually happens. So the idea is having the contact layer being the calcium alginate if it's bleeding versus if it's not bleeding, hence why it's in its own little sterile pack, you use the um, silicon foam, which is completely interfaced with silicon all over it, um, like the standard silicon foams that all of the countries have um, to, I guess, let the body do what it does best and um, promote and, and protect that granulation tissue. And then the next question was, uh, again, loving the skin tear pack, but who's responsible to ensure that the skin tear packs are refilled and available for the care homes or aged care centres, wherever they are? I think everybody. I think that, you know, it's, it's, um, you could essentially say it's a registered nurse's, um, decision and, or, or an enrolled nurse, depending on what, um, country you live in. Um, here in Australia, we have registered nurses and enrolled nurses, but at the same token, if they're not available or if you're grabbing one as an unregulated worker and a carer, then replace it essentially with everything in, in looking after um, someone's health care is that, you know, if you take something, then always replace it because, you know, to come back to it, um, it it's it's very handy if you're preparing for somebody else that's, that's going to come after you. And equally, the um, skin tear pack, the idea of it is that you can also use it as a consumer or if you're going out on day trips for like disability workers, et cetera. So whoever's in charge of, of packing that day, for example, or having all the care needs in place, everybody, everybody is responsible for protecting everybody's skin. And then somebody else has said, you said there's a decrease in the number of skin tears sustained after the pack was introduced, which is brilliant. Do you think that's associated with the improved education and therefore more attention is being given to skin handling, moving and prevention? I'm going to let Annette answer this one because she was at the forefront of that. Go for it. Go on, Annette. Thanks, Chloe. Um, yes, is the simple answer to that. Uh, I think there was just a heightened sense of, of knowledge, engagement, and as a result, that has been one of the byproducts. Absolutely. Have they cascaded the information down in it to other places as well once people have learned about it? Have they been sharing education? Uh, outside of the uh, organisation that did yeah. the trial? A absolutely. Um, it's it's a, actually really interesting um, a, a, in the organisation I'm currently in. We have a, a new registered nurse who came along um, recently employed with us and said, am I other previous job I used this amazing skin tear pack do you have those so it, it's it's really um been quite enthusiasm generated from word of mouth as well as um um uh the, I guess the practical um, implication where staff are actually seeing it so it's helping to generate some enthusiasm around that um I think just to pick up on something Chloe mentioned as well the the generating out into the community um some of the colleagues we have in aged care are also working in the disability and community sector and they're coming back and saying how amazing it is to just have some of those kits in the bus trip so when someone accidentally has an injury when they're out they know they're actually treating it with what is best practice um, in the first line of defense when it's actually occurred perhaps you know at a community outing or in a shopping center and not back at the home where the patient actually resides where they don't necessarily um, you know it might just be a good old band-aid that you know isn't the best practice because that's all they usually have in the first aid kit so it's been actually really helpful and also um people are really interested to get more information about this but you did mention you published haven't you chloe and annette would you be able to um send one of us on ISTAP or Troy the links to your papers we can put them on the website so people can go and have a look and then they can see about your work and what you did. 
Yeah, absolutely. We published in the European Wound Management Association journal. Um, Samantha Holloway helped with that. So, yes, definitely. Um, we're def we can definitely email you guys the link to the paper. It's no problem at all. Chloe, Annette, thank you for staying with us because it's probably silly o'clock where you are at the moment, but thank you very much. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, thank you for joining us. You're not at silly o'clock. You're the same time as us, which is good. <laughs> um, fascinating. Everybody's been saying they've listened to everything you've said because it's an area that people haven't thought about as well. You go and have your mammogram. And you just think, yes, you're going to get a squashed breast, but you're not going to get any skin damage. And people are really shocked about it. And they want to know, do you, you've done this narrative review now. Are you going to be doing more work in this area to try and highlight it and well, raise awareness, really? Yeah, thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, uh, we've recently had ethical approval at Salford and we're just waiting for NHS ethics approval to conduct a retrospective study, because what we want to do is try and get some retrospective data just to see if skin tears are reported uh, within any uh, organisations. And all of that data, the narrative review, the retrospective study will then inform a prospective study, uh, because what we want to do then going forward is develop communication strategy, patient information leaflets, better reporting, uh, when we've worked with the mammographers and consultant mammographers within some NHS organisations, the cards are so small for mammographers to assess a woman's skin uh, before the mammogram and afterwards. So there isn't space for them to actually record any skin damage. Uh, we've been doing lots of training locally in the Greater Manchester area and also on our mammogram programme here in Salford, there is a, a day dedicated to tissue viability and skin tears in mammography. And that's been happening for the last four or five years. So we're really pleased that we, locally, uh, but yeah, we are working towards a, a re well, retrospective and then a prospective study to look at this in more detail. So Mel, do you think you would, and I'm just making things up now in my head, really. Um, do you think you develop a skin tear pack then like Chloe and Annette have done? For um, I, yeah, I was thinking about that because I was thinking about some work that had gone on in the Isle of Man uh, when one of the nurses in A&E had developed a skin tear pack uh, for elderly patients who came into A&E uh, and did some training with A&E staff. So I think, yeah, as Annette and Chloe were talking, I thought, well, That'd be really great for mammographers because we've written some guidance. We've got the new National Breast Imaging Academy. We've got a, a, an online module now that we've created. Uh, so mammographers can actually go and do that training on e-learning for health. Um, but yeah, it would be great to have a kind of pack for mammographers so that they can reach for that. It, obviously, it makes sense. Because I also think we've talked about, Chloe and Annette very much talked about older people and managing the skin tears but with mammography it could be a lot younger woman that gets this skin tear and we do sometimes forget that we always think everything's for older people when in fact the skin can be really quite fragile and frail and the younger people so how do you think you're going to get that message across to younger people who might just think oh I've just got a bit of a cut it does I don't have to worry about it yeah, so other work that we've been doing is actually to do uh, what we call um, a, a kind of ethnography, a, a digital ethnography. So it, uh, we've got a paper in review at the moment where we've been actually looking at forums where patient forums, women's forums, uh, where women are reporting and putting pictures of themselves and their skin injuries, their skin tears. Um, and it's made for obviously quite distressing and also quite fascinating in, uh, reading so what we found is actually there are a lot of women who are young who are getting skin tears and they're then putting other women off because they think they're going to get skin tears as well and it's not your usual uh, type of patient as I said in the Nelson study and that was locally in Greater Manchester that actually 
you know, two of the women who developed skin tears were perimenopausal. They were had a family familial history of cancer, had gone for uh, screening, for symptomatic screening, and they developed a skin tear. We think it's all to do with um, education about staying still during the compression of the breast, not pulling away, and obviously uh, general information about not putting creams on your breast, not wearing deodorant. Um, but also, I think there is a duty of care for the mammographers, you know, the some of the women who contributed to case studies in our chapter talked about um, not not being heard, not being listened to. Um, so again, we've, we've made that as part of our training uh, for mammographers and for the National Study Days as well. That is really important. Fascinating, Alex, what you just said about the not creaming and the not wearing deodorant. When you go to the doctors or you go to, I said, a dentist, the hospital, and they're like, you have a shower, don't you, generally? You put your yeah. deodorant on, you cream up because you don't want people to think you're unclean, you want to look your best. And yet this is completely the opposite. Don't cream, don't put deodorant on. But yeah. that's the first thing you do before you go out. Yeah, so again, it's changing patient information leaflets for those undergoing mammograms. Uh, yeah, there's a complete change. Some, some We're very lucky. Some mammography units have already started to change their information leaflets, especially in the local area. People have come on the mam mammogram course and uh, they've started to change practice. But we do need some retrospective, solid data from our own uh, trusts and also then some prospective data to see and observe what's happening in practice. Melanie, thank you. It's something really new. And I've just noticed that it's now five o'clock UK time so we've run out of time for all the questions I've tried to do the major ones and join them together but Sam and I will look at them and do some answers and put them up on the website so just for my closing remarks I'd like to thank all the speakers obviously it's been fascinating I've learned loads and I hope that the participants have as well thank you all very much for staying on I know we're running over a little bit I'd also like to thank all the sponsors who makes this day possible and to thank Troy, who's working like a Trojan behind the scenes to make sure this all works well as well. So thank you, Troy. Thank you to Enswok as well for having us. And thank you to all the regional directors. I think they were really interesting to hear that this truly is a global organisation. You can see what people are doing. I do encourage everybody, if you're not a member of ISTAT, to please join because everything is free, which is always a good. So you can go to the members area, but also we hold our nominations for director posts as well. So that's always really good that you can become a part of ISTAT and really help us change. Things are changing. And I think all the sessions today have very much told a story from telling you about the skin, why it's important to how to prevent skin tears, how to help people in the community, but also new areas that we've maybe not thought about for a long time. The sessions are all recorded and should be up on the website um, within the next couple of days. And please do fill in the evaluation forms, which will ensure that you do get your certificate as well. And Troy has his hand up. Troy. If I could just invite all of our regional directors, our presenters, anyone who's on here as a panelist to just turn on your video for a second. We'll just do a quick group uh, group photo, if you don't mind, as well, that we could post afterwards. So I'll let uh, those who are on uh, behind the scenes here. That, um, yes. Mary, Salva, Heidi, Pia, Emmy. Do you want me to go off? No, no, come on. All our presenters and regional directors, everyone here. We want to get a good group photo of everyone involved. Awesome. Mm -hmm. We'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone else is able to turn on their camera for uh, Pia or uh, got, I just think just Pia, if you are there, turn on your camera. My Otherwise, camera, we can... my camera is oh, blocked. Here. Oh, here, no, let me sorry. fix that for you. That's my fault. Let me fix that for you. You can try. Uh, you can try now if you'd like. And so that's the same thing. Thank oh, you so you much. Guys. I'm sorry to interrupt your presentation there, Karen, but we Don't couldn't worry. miss this great video. So I'll count down from five and then everybody smile. So five, four, three, two, one, big smiles. Thanks so much, everyone. And I'll turn it back over to you, Karen.
Thanks, Troy. And it's just to say thank you to everybody. We we like to be an open organisation. It was founded, as you know, with um, Sharon and Kim many years ago, and it's just continued. We've continued to work on their great work. So please do join us. Don't feel shy about asking questions either, and do access the website. And we look forward to seeing you all again in April 2025 for the fourth World Without Skin Tear Day. And thank you to Sam as president for getting us all together and Mary for sorting out this great education day. So thank you all very much. Have a good morning, evening or night. Thank you all.